but we were privileged, Charlotte and I, uh, last December to be able to uh, drive uh, all the way. Uh, well, you, you've probably heard a story about traveling uh, throughout the uh, Chasing Christmas tour. And uh, we were able to uh, show up in um, what we know is Auschwitz in Poland uh, on a bitterly cold winter night, check into, believe it or not, a Hampton Inn in the town center and stay there, had a great dinner right next door at a wonderful Italian, Polish Italian restaurant that was fantastic. And then we spent the next day touring around the Auschwitz, Auschwitz and the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. Um, the day was very appropriate for it because it was gray, cold, snow on the ground, miserable conditions, the, the fog was there, and it just gave us a better understanding of what uh, folks who were interned there had to do to put up with and their living conditions. And we, uh, we showed up and, you know, it was uh, during that time when Omicron was uh, at its height almost, at its peak, and it was also a time where folks weren't traveling because it was so much uh, right near the holiday Christmas season. And so we were just a part of a group of about uh, maybe 10 or 15 people. And uh, it's compulsory to get a local guide there to uh, walk you through and share the experience of the camp and introduce it to, uh, to us who had never been. Uh, so I have a series of videos and photos that I've taken I'll talk a little bit over the top of it as well. There's not a whole lot of, uh, well, there's nothing cheery about any of it, uh, but it was very sobering and somber. And just like any other concentration camp I, that was developed by the Nazis that I've visited in other parts of Europe. So let me share my screen and we'll move on with that. Okay, this is just a, a map that uh, we use for um, our best of Eastern Europe tour that begins in Berlin, goes down to Prague, hits Krakow, and then the Auschwitz concentration camp, and then finishes up down in Hungary, just to give you an idea of where everything is. And as we all know now, uh, especially with all the current events going on, Poland's a pretty large country, but just beyond that is the Ukraine, which is uh, being inundated with a uh, war there uh, imposed by Russia. And um, so you can see we were very close to the border of, uh, of, U of Ukraine. And I imagine that many of the uh, refugees who are trying to escape Ukraine now are hightailing it over here to this area where we were in uh, Krakow and also even further to the west here in the Auschwitz area. Now, first order of business is that the Polish do not know this town as Auschwitz. Uh, that is a German name because the Germans could not pronounce the Polish name of this town. And so they just devised their own name that sounds similar to that. And so the way that I have been told that this town is pronounced is, let me look at my note card, Ostiemshim. Ostiemshim. And uh, so that's the Polish name of this town. And that's what it's known as today. If you were to go to the town center, which is about, uh, oh, two miles away from the Auschwitz concentration camp, if you were to go there, the town center looks very similar to any other small little town uh, that you might find in the Habsburg Empire. For example, uh, maybe not quite as lavish as Salzburg, but very pretty. Uh, maybe like uh, Linz or Melk. Uh, we talked about that in the last couple of weeks as well, but a very nice little town on a river and then across the river and down, down the way down the river tracks a little bit were a former barracks of the Polish army. And um, so I'll, I'll get the video running here and try to talk over a little bit. And pardon me, but I have uh, quite, a, quite a few notes that I've taken because I've watched a lot of do documentaries. And since I've returned back 
and also uh, read a lot of stuff on this. So here is the main gate of the main Auschwitz concentration camp. And every concentration camp the Germans have have this phrase over it, Arbeit macht frei, work will make you free. And once again, this is uh, the image of that. Coming up next is every day the prisoners here would be marched out on this road where my group is walking uh, to work during the day and then to march back in in the evening. And in order to keep their pace steady, that image you just saw was of the prisoners who were musicians playing marches so that the prisoners would march in step to be counted as they walk through, right where we're standing down here is where that little band was set up. Here is um, two images that were sketched by a prisoner of war, not a prisoner of war, a, a Jewish intern there, uh, inmate there, that was sketched with uh, the prisoners walking out to go to work during the day. And then the next image that I have is the gentleman sketching it of the prisoners coming back in, carrying their dead with the band playing. This is also a painting that was done in 1948, so after the war, of a, uh, of a, a Jewish, uh, Hungarian Jewish artist who painted this where they were made to dig the foundations of these barracks that you saw. You saw the barracks are all made out of uh, brick and mortar. And um, the former Polish army garrison barracks were made of bricks and mortar. But many of the concentration camps that I've been to, uh, well, many of, maybe some of you have been to uh, Dachau with me or to Mauthausen, all of those are wooden barracks with hardly any insulation or anything. But because of the harsh climate here in Poland and this region, uh, everything is bricks and mortar. So these guys were, uh, these uh, uh, Jewish um, slaves were being made to dig the foundation and make the two-story barracks so it would house more people. Um, this is just a sketch of the town. It's one of the placards along the way, but uh, the town of um, Auschwitz or Ostiemschem is right here. And this, this river is very important for navigation and for transportation. You see the black and white dotted lines are railroad lines. Now where we stayed, Charlotte and I stayed was right beyond this river right here at that Hampton Inn I referred to. So in order to get to this, the first camp, which was the former Polish army barracks right here, all we had to do was, was drive across the river, make a left-hand turn and in three minutes we were there. So you can imagine this camp being just outside the normal population of the town, but yet everything was, as you'll see in some of the videos, everything was behind uh, electrified fences and walls so that uh, of course there would be no contact with the prisoners who were inside the camp and the civilians outside the camp just steered clear because, uh, you know, I guess that term, uh, you know, uh, if, if you can't see it, you don't have to live it, I suppose. So that was a common denominator on a lot of the concentration camps as well. This is walking down that main road by the gate, through the gate. You can see it had just snowed. Uh, well, those are pretty substantial buildings. I know you can't hear that, but I, I just I just wanted to connect here and make sure that we uh, were able to see what it looked like and, and notice that it was almost a whole community. And it had if you didn't know it was a concentration camp, you would have think it's a bunch of plants where people lived. In a few minutes, we'll look inside this area. But this part of the concentration camp was the, the first and the oldest, and it only contained uh, between 15 and 20,000 inmates or people at any given time. Uh, and that was early on. Uh, by the way, 
I don't know if I even covered it, but uh, you know, World War II, as we know it, did not really begin until the Nazis invaded Poland. And that was uh, September 1st, 19, uh, 1939. And when the Nazis invaded Poland, that was sort of a red line uh, for the French and the, the English of saying, well, we're getting into war, we're, we're throwing everything in. And as you know, we Americans who were uh, separated from that in the United States by a whole ocean, uh, we didn't get involved in that war until uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor several years later. But uh, the Europeans were all in by the time September 1st uh, came around. It took them from September 1st until, uh, the, until the middle of October, or October 6th, actually, to totally conquer Poland and occupy it. And that means putting their flags up, putting uh, uh, you know, their SS in and guards in and just overtaking the country. And then uh, if you happen to be Jewish, what happened with that was that you were totally ousted from your position. So if you were Jewish and owned the uh, factory, then that factory was overtaken and given by the Nazis to a local non-Jewish person and the Jewish person, the Jewish person that had formerly owned it, or you know whatever, would if he was deemed a necessary Jew, then he he and his family were kind of left alone in order to run the business, but he would have no ownership of it. But in most cases, they just uh, took the Jews and started shipping them off because the Nazis felt that the Jews were an inferior race. So this uh, image you see right here is the image of Auschwitz in the middle of Europe. And you can see this uh, image is from where all, all the cities from where Jews were uh, imported to Auschwitz by train uh, during the course of uh, 1940 to 1945. So it's uh, kind of centrally located, but it's also in the middle of Poland, away from the prying eyes of everybody in Germany. Of course, you didn't want them to see that. And these other countries uh, in the world as well, and, and the prying eyes of the United States and the British and the French and everybody else. These are some images uh, I just snapped on placards and in the museum. Um, you can see this, uh, this quote is just so chilling. Jews are a race that must be totally exterminated. This is uh, the governor general of Nazi occupied Poland uh, in 1944. And these are some chilling facts as well. In the years 1940 to 45, the Nazis deported at least uh, 1,300,000 people to Auschwitz. 1.1 million were Jews, uh, 140 to 150,000 were Poles, 23,000 were Roma gypsies, 15,000 were pro, uh, Soviet prisoners of war, and 25,000 were prisoners from other ethnic uh, groups. 1.1 million of these people died in Auschwitz. Approximately 90% of the victims were Jews that died there, and the SS murdered them by gassing them and then burning their bodies and scattering them over pits and fields there. This is a little timeline of, of what was going on. And a timeline of what was going on starting in 1940. I wanted to point out that 19 June of 1940 was the beginning of the de deportation of the Poles because not, uh, Poland was occupied and the idea of Hitler was to eradicate that country of 6 million people in Poland and to uh, replace it with uh, Germans and that were of that, that Aryan race that uh, Hitler was looking for and to uh, just disintegrate the population so that it was uh, down to about 2 million indigenous Poles and the rest of them were Germans so that it would look like 
Bavaria is the idea of what um, Hitler wanted to do. Then in June 1941, um, beginning of the deportations of 25,000 prisoners of various nationalities, about half of them perished in the camp. Now those Roma gypsies that we talked about were also considered a very inferior race, but they were not exterminated even through the end of the war uh, because um, they were left in camps in this uh, second camp that I'm going to talk about as well. And then beginning in the summer of 41, there were POWs there, and most of them died, Soviet POWs there, most of them died there. And then the next slide here, March of 1942, began the deportation of 1.1 million Jews and that was when Auschwitz began to fulfill two functions. It, it became the biggest mass murder uh, site in history and all of my, mankind. And the Nazis were the ones who instigated that. And about 1 million deported Jews were murdered by the SS, mainly in gas chambers. In February 43, there was also those Roman gypsies who were uh, Roma gypsies who were also began to be uh, exported and housed there, but yet they were not gassed uh, or, and so they were left in their family units intact in one segment of this camp here at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The next series of slides are just some slides that I, I took photos in the uh, museum. And uh, these are where the trains would come in and the train would pull up and there were these uh, SS officers and doctors who would uh, tell people getting off the train, you either go to the right or to the left. And it depended on their age and their appearance. And if you were healthy and able to work, you went to the right. If you were not, you went to the left. And that meant mostly women and children went to the left and were immediately marched to the gas chambers. This is that uh, they're, they're taking all the suitcases and things that the, uh, the, the Jews would bring and they're uh, sorting them out. They would take them and cash in on anything they could and uh, then sell it and make money and whatnot. These are some of the ash pits uh, where ashes from the, uh, the cremation would happen. This is inside the museum and these are actual images that I took, the cups, combs, eyeglasses. These are, those are just tons of eyeglasses right there in the museum where people just, they took them off. This was a sort of a, a, a model of the gas chamber. So the Jews would be brought in on a train, hit that platform called the dividing platform. If you were designated that you were capable of doing some kind of work, you were sent on the right. If you were otherwise, kids, uh, women, young children, babies were all to the left. They were immediately marched to this uh, area right here on the top. They undressed thinking that they were gonna be uh, showered because of uh, the infestation of uh, being in the cattle car that they were in for days and days and days. Down here underground was the gas chamber. They locked them in, put in that Cyclone B gas, killed them all, and then uh, workers at the camp who were also prisoners were compelled to take them to this building where the, uh, the furnaces were and to uh, burn them up and then take the ashes and scatter them in the big ash pits all over the place. And there was uh, six of these at least at this Auschwitz-Birkenau camp. Ugh. Just more images of people queued up at the very beginning before they knew what was going to happen. This is also interesting. The next series is uh, um, those who were infirmed with crutches, uh, prosthetics, or anything else like that. Um, they had no chance at all. So those things were just piled up, thrown, maybe they're going to sell them or whatever. And the, the, the owner of that was immediately marched to the gas chamber. If you couldn't work, there's no way that you would be even surviving. These are cyclone gas canisters that of course had been used 
Here's the kids, unfortunately, marching off to the gas chamber. This is the dividing platform right there. You can see uh, on the left and right, let me go back, that's worthy of moving back one slide if I can. I guess I moved back a lot more than one slide. These are, I, and I didn't point these out, but these are suitcases. They were all with the names on them. They were encouraged to label them so they would be waiting for them after they finished their showers. Of course, none of that happened at all. Uh, it's just impossible for this, th this to even register of how many shoes. You can think of a building as long as a football field with these glass windows uh, that are eight feet deep and 10 feet tall. And behind those glass windows are shoes, piles of shoes, piles of glasses, piles of suitcases. One thing that was there too that is just so chilling that we did not take photos of is, is tons and tons of hair because everyone was shaven when they arrived and that hair was collected and sent off to factories where they would manufacture uh, uniforms for their soldiers with that hair. And uh, when, in the, the, when it was liberated, there was, I think the... The, the number that sticks in my mind is around seven tons of hair that uh, was still there in bales ready to be shipped off. And it's just, it's just un, unbelievable that any human being would think to do that. And how can any human being follow orders to do that? I'm going to pause right here because I see there's a couple of chat messages up here that... Oh, okay, got it. I recall going to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. some years ago with my students and those shoes, that shoe display was just so touching on everyone. A whole hallway was lined with these photographs of, of early uh, prisoners who were there. And uh, after it got so busy, later on, after a couple of years, they just quit taking photos of anybody. But uh, the, those that they marched straight away to the gas chambers never got a chance for a tattoo or a folder or anything. And those that were prisoners were just tattooed and no photo evidence was taken. These are some more uh, drawings uh, and sketches and paintings of uh, former uh, prisoners there that uh, when they finally were liberated, were able to go back home after a few years and in their memory or from their sketchbook recall some of the horrific actions that the SS guards placed upon them. This is an interesting fact here that says, until the spring of 43, almost every Auschwitz prisoner was photographed for identification. Later on, only German prisoners and occasionally prisoners of other nationalities were photographed. Jews who were brought in for mass transit and mass extermination uh, did not have a tattoo or a photograph. There's tattoo, and you know, we always thought the tattoos were just on their arms, but it's on their chest, their thigh, leg, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that, that designation occurred, but those were some images that we saw. Women and children were there as well, and they were interned. Those with the black triangle are Roman, Roma gypsies. Back outside of the museum, just to look at the wall there, the guard tower. Two rows of barbed wire fences that are electrified, and of course, a little sign that says halt. <laughs> this is all at the smaller camp. 
the Auschwitz One camp uh, that we first visited. Remember, it it it, it would accommodate fifteen to twenty thousand prisoners. Now, on that site were was also a crematorium, but nothing like the ones I'm going to show you in a few minutes. But uh, prisoners were also gassed and exterminated here as well. But also the ones who died going to work every day or died in the barracks, uh, they, were, they were cremated here as well. This is going inside the gas chamber. The doors will be shut. The guards ask us to drop down that cyclone gas. It would take about 15 minutes. The bodies would be transported here and burned. So we're now leaving Auschwitz camp number one. You can see how it's heavily fortified. Guards all over the place. And then we're arriving at what's known as Auschwitz camp two or Auschwitz Birkenau. And this train track would come right along that river and uh, would go directly in through this tunnel and arrive at that uh, big area, which is covered with lime rock at that then and now is still there. And that would be what was known as the dividing platform. Now this was, uh, I'm looking at this. From 42 to 44 is when this camp uh, was really at its height. And you can see right there, going straight down through there, uh, the train would pull up, and you'll see a car here in a minute. And that's when all of the people would be rudely ushered out of that uh, cattle car, basically, and onto that uh, dividing platform. This is where that pole kind of marks the left and right. You see, we're looking back toward where the train would come in. Here's an example of that kind of those cattle cars. We did a whole lot of walking that day, about six miles, because it was a long way from one spot to the other. Now, this is down where the gas chambers were and the crematoriums were. So at the very end of the war, when the Nazis realized that uh, the Soviets and the Americans, well, mostly the Soviets were pressing down on them and it was gonna be discovered that this camp was there, they bombed all of those gas chambers and crematoriums. And uh, so now they're in ruins. And then they took most, any resident of the camp who was still alive and capable of walking and took them on what we now know as death marches, uh, you know, up to 100, 150 miles to get them away from the impending liberation by the Soviets when they, when they, when they would arrive and overtake the camp. And so this is uh, the memorial there that has an ins inscription in uh, every language that a prisoner spoke uh, about, the, about their death and their time in the camp. And then the memorial also resembles, uh, also this down here resembles uh, the chimney of the uh, crematorium. Now this is the original gas chambers that the, everything has fallen down and crushed down onto because of the Nazis uh, blowing them up and then evacuating. But it's a very sacred and hallowed place because 1.1 million people died there. Look at all those furnaces. This is part of the crematorium, part of the chimney there. Now underground is the gas chambers.
these little markers out there mark mass grave pits where uh, the ash was just buried. And there are many of those. Black commemorating stones over there. There's one of the ash pans. Uh, other places where human ashes were thrown are located on the other side of the camp, uh, nearby places where there were chromatized number four and uh, five. But again, large part of human ashes was just thrown into the river. At this camp, it would house uh, about 100,000 prisoners. And remember I said Jews never got a chance to live in these uh, barracks here, but other ethnic groups uh, were housed here along with some POWs, but 100,000 of them here compared to the 15, 20,000 that Auschwitz Camp 1 would accommodate. We're heading back, ending our tour. This is after about four hours. Hey, David McGuffin here at uh, Auschwitz 2 Bergenau one of the two death camps here in the area, the most well-known one. Uh, we spent about uh, three and a half, four hours touring around this place with a local guide. Got some great information. The day could not be better for this type of uh, tour because you can see cloudy, cold, dismal, just like the conditions here at this camp. So whether you like it or not, I do hope you enjoy uh, and learn something from this little tour around Auschwitz and Auschwitz to Birkenau camp here in Poland. We went in one of these barracks as well, and these uh, barracks were uh, uh, used uh, to house those workers that would uh, clean up all the mess after after the gas chambers and the burn up uh, the bodies. And uh, although they, did, they didn't like it, they did have a little bit better living conditions, but as you can see, this is terrible. Everybody has their own bunk with a number on it, and there's about 12 people on each one of those bunks, so the conditions are not so great at all. Dirt floor, very little heating, very little insulation. This is a, a chimney where there would have been a fire, uh, maybe, that was lit in the winter time. And finally, we get to walk through another gate out of this place. Okay, so I uh, thank you for sticking with me on this. Uh, it, again, I have uh, spent the last couple of three days uh, reviewing a lot of information online, reading a book about it, several books, um, and also watching some uh, really, really good uh, videos on YouTube. I'll put all those links uh, at Travel Talk Tuesday, davidmcguffin.com forward slash TTT for you to look at it. But one of the most uh, 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 chilling books that I've read about it is one my daughter-in-law Lori gave me for Christmas a couple of years ago. It's called uh, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. And uh, it's uh, well worth a read to kind of get the idea of what it's like to be in that camp and what it's like uh, to be on the other side of the fence as uh, a young kid uh, befriending uh, a prisoner on the other side of the fence. And uh, so that's the one you ought to read, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas or Striped Pajamas. And uh, so take a look at that as well. And uh, so let me break away from this subject real quick and go to the, our closing remarks here. Um, we're still in the midst of uh, showcasing our tours throughout the United States. And uh, we have, uh, are going this weekend to uh, the very first time ever to the Travel Adventure Show in New York City, right downtown at the Javits Center. 
If you're a follower of me and on my email list, you may have gotten some information about that, of how to get some uh, free tickets and everything else. But it will be Saturday and Sunday this coming weekend uh, in Manhattan. So if you live in the region or uh, come by and see us, uh, give me a text or something. I can certainly uh, help you with those free tickets. If you haven't got the email, we'd love to see you. There's a lot of great things going on there. Uh, one of which is uh, us showcasing our tours, giving discounts for those tours, but also a lot of other travel providers from everywhere from the Caribbean, the United States and places even further away than that. Uh, so we'll be doing that. And uh, I guess maybe next week for Travel Talk Tuesday, I'll be showcasing a little bit of our experience in New York City uh, because got, that's kind of like a foreign destination now as well. And I'm a bit apprehensive uh, about going because of all the uh, stuff you hear on the news about it. But good news is that my former high school, Ridgeview High School, where I was a teacher for 30 years, just finished up their choir and band trip there this week. And it was wonderful. They had no problems. And it was a, a great experience for them. And uh, last week, I met with uh, uh, a former student of mine, Caroline, who uh, lives in New York, up there in Harlem. And she said, oh, forget everything you hear on the news. Everything is perfectly fine in New York City. So we're looking forward to going there. So I'm going to share with you some of our adventures in New York next Tuesday night on Travel Talk Tuesday. So thank you for sticking with me and dealing with this terrible subject. We just hope it never, ever happens again. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.